So I know what you're thinking, when is the panel gonna get up here? And so we're almost there, we're, we wanna introduce them as well. But before we do, <clears throat> we'd like to highlight some points that frame this discussion. After working for this for more than a year, we have some takeaways that we'd like to impart on you. Right now, 90% of BLM lands around Chaco in the northwest of New Mexico have been leased to oil and gas. And in the Pecos district, which is in Carlsbad, 83% of public lands have been leased to oil and gas. Public lands are designated as multiple use by ranchers, farmers, sportsmen, recreationists, and extractive industries. Ranchers and farmers purchase grazing rights, as we've seen in this film, and water rights. They're paying annual leases. Sportsmen purchase hunting and fishing permits. However, when 80 to 90% of lands are leased to oil and gas, it makes it very difficult for other users to, who annually pay their fees to use these lands to participate in, the, in, in public lands because the disturbance is not only at the well site, it is with the roads, it is with the electricity, and it is with the pipelines. This makes it very difficult to take out many, 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 many acres that are no longer accessible to the plants and animals that call this place home. And I, I recognize some faces in the room, some of you here tonight with us are, are industry folks, but I'm betting more of you are hunters, fishermen, mountain bikers, campers, uh, farmers and ranchers. And when this land is taken by one industry, it is less available to you and to your children and your children's children. We are sacrificing our land for energy independence. For the United States, and now we are a major exporter of this important resource. And that is significant, as Elisa said in our film. It's important. But when we have this level of sacrifice, what do we get in return? Will it return the health of the land, the water, and the rivers? If we hold it, there is a value choice on how we use public lands. That is a discussion worth having. Right now, the Pecos District in the southeast is the crown jewel of public lands for the Department of the Interior. It has produced the most revenue of any public land in the country, and in early September sold the highest value of leases to oil and gas ever, coming in at almost a billion dollars. This is important revenue to our state, for sure. Yet, how do we reconcile this resource, how do we reconcile this resource with uses for future generations? And how do we leverage this resource now to diversify our economy tomorrow? And how do we use these same lands for renewable resources for our energy for our communities today? That is why we are here tonight, and that is the purpose of this panel discussion. So, without further ado, let us introduce them to you. Um, as I introduce you, just go ahead and make your way to the stage. Our moderator tonight is Laura Pascas. Laura Pascas is the esteemed environmental reporter from New Mexico Political Report. She is also correspondent for the New Mexico In Focus on KNME TV. She's been a reporter covering New Mexico and Western water, climate, and energy issues since 2002, when she started her journalism career at High Country News. She's written for national and regional magazines like The Progressive and Miss Magazine, local papers like The Santa Fe Reporter, and reported for KUNM 89.9 FM, and she's also been on, in our film on Chapter 3 and participated with Unearthed, so thank you. Next, please welcome Congresswoman Michelle Lujan Grisham. Michelle's lawyer by trade, she has been an Michelle has been an active voice on senior and child care and health care issues in New Mexico prior to her work as Congresswoman. She has served three terms in the United States Congress and has held the chair of the Congressional Hispanic Caucus, which boasts 30 members. She is also a candidate for governor. Please welcome her. And we. Thank you. 
As thrilled as we are to have her here tonight, it is important, I feel, to say that we did invite Representative Steve Pierce to also join this conversation on stage tonight. We invited him on the same day that we invited Congresswoman Grisham, and we regret that he is not here with us. Our next panelist is Garrett Veneclausen. Garrett spent 10 or more so years of his life traveling in remote locations of the world, guiding fly fishing tours. Then he also worked for Trout Unlimited. He was executive director of the New Mexico Wildlife Federation, and he's now a consultant on public lands, air, water, and wildlife. <laughs> Elisa Ogden. In a in addition to what you already know about Elisa, she is also in the Cowgirl Hall of Fame. And uh, she was uh, president of the, uh, she was president uh, for the New Mexico Cattlemen's Association. And our final panelist is John Goldstein. John is very popular. Um, John uh, is visiting with us from Denver. Uh, he works for the um, Environmental Defense Action Fund, and he is a senior policy advisor. Thank you for being here, John. You'll notice in your pamphlet that we had a fifth panelist who unfortunately could not be here today. Daryl Wefflin works with Airworks Compressors, and he is a pioneer uh, in technology, methane capture, um, and he is an advocate for methane capture. He believes that oil and gas can be a clean uh, with uh, using compressed air to uh, operate wells instead of using gas. Um, and we regret that he was caught in a snowstorm. Some of what I hope we get to have this winter here. Um, anyway, um, he has left some remarks, um, and these are they. Uh, we only learned this morning, uh, he really did call and said, uh, from Edmonton, uh, and said that uh, the earliest he could get here was 8.30, 9 o'clock tonight. We said, couldn't make that. He did leave some remarks. I'd like to just read a couple of them. Uh, he, it's quite a lengthy remark. We're just going to read uh, uh, just a, a, a quick, short piece of it. I regret that I'm unable to be there in person this evening. The message I was hoping to present tonight was that regardless of current rules and regulations on methane venting, flaring, and leaking on well sites across the country, the problem still exists and is vastly underreported. While I do not feel that underreported amounts are intentional, but are more than likely due to a common miscalculation in the conversion of field gas to compressed air at well sites, this results in permits being issued based on a miscalculation of seven to nine times under the actual usage of required to operate the wells. This miscalculation has been seen everywhere from actual site permits to an EPA white paper. Ultimately, an instrument air system takes methane emissions from venting and flaring out of the picture of the well site by replacing the natural gas currently used to operate the well's pumps and controls. Moving from the use of a natural gas as an environmentally harmful but inexpensive and easy method of operating well site equipment and simply converting to clean, compressed air is a long-term, sustainable solution regardless of regulations. After all, it is what we do when no one else is looking that sets people and corporations ahead of the competition. Thank you. All right, is this thing on? All right, um, thank you all for coming out tonight. Volunteers are gonna be passing around cards and hopefully you all brought your pens and your pencils with you so that you can write down questions that you have for the panelists. Um, at some point, I will let you know to raise your hand so that, um, or you can raise your hand now if you'd like a card and um, volunteers will be collecting those in a little while. We'll try to get to as many questions as possible. But um, so thank you for coming tonight. And Elisa, I'd like to start with you. Um, in the film, you talked about how your family has been on this land for 128 years. And you said it looked a lot different, most likely, when your family showed up. I'm curious what you think, given um, development and a aridification happening in the southwestern United States, what do you envision in another 128 years on your family's landscape? 
I can't envision another 128 years. Um, the progress that we have made in trying to do rangeland improvement has been tremendous. Um, I've participated, I don't know if any of y'all are aware, but the Bureau of Land Management had come up with a program called Restore New Mexico, in which they looked at a landscape. And so we've done a lot of rangeland improvement through that Restore New Mexico, and it's been on both state, federal, and private lands. Um, the impact of the oil and gas industry is um, overwhelming, to say the least. And I think there has to be involved in that a plan for reclamation and how to try to have the least amount of impact as possible. But I cannot envision what another 128 years would be like. But I, I think the most important thing is, is for a concerted effort on all parts to have the min most minimal impact as possible. So I'm curious, have you seen examples of successful restoration of oil and gas development either on your land or nearby? Like, have you seen well pads that have been reclaimed or restored? So on private land and on federal land, we're much more concerned and much more restrictive on how the reclamation is done. You've got to remove all the caliche off of there. There has to be clean soil. OCD's kind of changing those regulations, and I think they're not good changes. Um, the state land is getting to where they're doing a better job of how reclamation is done, but on, our, on state land and on some of the private land, you know, prior to knowing how, what needed the requirements need to be done, um, there, and there has to be ways to take off all of the soil that's contaminated, all the cleachy that's brought in. The number one thing that was changed in the process of drilling that has helped to, to not create a big problem was when we went to a closed loop system and there were no longer the pits because there are still pits out there 50 years later that are, they don't even grow African rue and if you can't grow African rue, it's a noxious weed, you can't grow anything, I promise you. Mesquite won't even grow, but African rue is number one on the list. So I think there's, th there's knowledge with time, and those things have been improving with time, and it has to do with the fact that there's more strict rules and regulations. We passed a bill called the Surface Owner Protection Act on private land, but oil companies look at that, and they even do it on state land, and federal, they have different guidelines. And so with those reclamation, remediation, all those things were taken into consideration. So that has had a lot to do with lessening the impact on the surface. Okay. Um, Garrett. Jordan and David talked about this a little bit in the introduction, but public lands, and I'm sure lots of our audience members are familiar with the way public lands are supposed to work. They're multi-use different people and industries and interests are supposed to have access to them. Can you talk a little bit about what you see happening in New Mexico with public lands where oil and gas development is occurring? Is there still a multi-use mandate in place? You know, a lot of my friends uh, experience and complain about uh, when oil and gas moves into an area, uh, you know, fences go up and, and access is, is limited sometimes severely and oftentimes uh, completely uh, eliminated. And um, obviously with well density, um, you know, the, the impact on habitat is, is really, really incredible. And um, obviously in the, in the Four Corners, we have huge wildlife corridors between, Calif between uh, Colorado and New Mexico. Uh, we're seeing entire herds of, of Mule deer, for example, Middle Mesa had the most robust herd of mule deer in the entire West, and that herd was uh, absolutely decimated by uh, oil and gas development. So, um, you know, and, and we're seeing impacts of, of erosion. We're seeing impacts uh, that are really far-reaching and, and hard to remediate, because when you completely destroy a wildlife corridor, uh, wildlife goes somewhere else. And, you know, again, my my friend calls it the mammoth in the room, uh, is, is climate change. And, 
it's sort of timely, this intergovernmental panel on climate change just did a 700-page report on the impact, impacts of global warming, uh, uh, 2.7 degrees Fahrenheit. We have, uh, and this is a thousand different scientists from around the world, we have 12 years to turn this around. And uh, I don't think we can stress enough the catastrophic importance of this. And many of us have children, many of us have uh, grandchildren. Congratulations, by the way. I think it's our moral duty, absolutely, as a generation. Uh, I, I can't look my daughter in the eye and, and tell her that, you know, we have a catastrophic situation. And uh, regardless of multiple use or how we love uh, or manage or mismanage or steward our public lands and resources, we owe it to our kids to, uh, to turn this thing around and do it immediately and seriously. So John, you and I have talked a number of times over the years about development occurring in New Mexico, and more recently, the big boom happening in the Permian Basin, and the amount of money that big companies in particular now are investing in the Permian Basin. And there's a lot of talk um, in the Permian and up in the San Juan Basin that there needs to be more infrastructure. Industry needs more pipelines, they need more gas processing plants. What kind of infrastructure do you think industry needs to be talking about and that we need to be seeing in these basins? Well, I think as we saw in the you know, beautiful video here that David and Jordan created, and you know, I wanna thank them for doing this panel tonight and thank the Congresswoman for being here too. Um, there's a tremendous amount of infrastructure already in the Permian Basin. There's been oil and gas development in southeastern New Mexico for well in 100 years. And um, so a, a lot of it's there. It's true um, that you know, with this huge uptick in um, oil and gas drilling down there, there needs to be more. And it's not just oil infrastructure that needs, that's needed, it's gas infrastructure too. Because right now, with the price of natural gas what it is, and the price of oil what it is, um, these producers are going after the oil, making sure they get that to market, and the gas is almost seen as a nuisance and um, just burned off or allowed to escape to the atmosphere often, um, which is a big driver of the climate change in the IPCC report um, that Garrett was just mentioning. So um, one of the ways we can make sure this infrastructure happens in tandem with the development is through requiring things uh, like gas capture plants. Um, the state has just barely begun to do that uh, under the current administration. Um, it is far less strong than what uh, the Obama administration tried to put in place through the Bureau of Land Management, um, a, a requirement that was actually just repealed by the Trump administration a few weeks ago. So um, there's an opportunity here for the state to step up and require gas capture plans so that these companies are talking to the pipe, uh, pipeline companies, making sure that the development is happening in tandem with the pipelines getting to these drill sites. Um, and also just by straight up uh, requiring uh, uh, methane emission uh, reductions, uh, similar to what uh, states like Colorado have done, where um, the governor of Colorado said he had zero tolerance for methane. Um, it really brought the oil and gas industry to the table with the conservation groups and the state regulators to develop a solution that's been very successful at driving 75% uh, reduction in emissions in Colorado and uh, an increase yeah, in revenue. So I know this audience is very clever and they know this, but can you sort of remind everyone that when we're talking about methane as a pollutant, methane as a greenhouse gas, that's also something else, right? That's absolutely right. So methane, uh, that is this huge problem. It's creating this hot spot over the San Juan Basin. It is uh, uh, more than 80 times more powerful pound for pound in the short term than carbon dioxide at driving climate change. It's this big problem. Methane is also the primary component of the natural gas you use to cook your dinner, to heat your home, um, that the state uses to raise revenue uh, for schools. And so it's this incredible win-win where if we capture these emissions, we're doing right by the climate, we're doing right by the school kids of New Mexico because there's more funding for their schools, and, and we're also you know, raising this revenue. So. Um, it's, yeah, it's, it's kind of a no-brainer, really. Representative, thank you for being here tonight. 
Um, as Garrett mentioned, the IPCC report came out this week, and y'all should read New Mexico Political Report tomorrow, so you can find out what that means for New Mexico. But one of the big take-home messages of that report is that we basically have a decade That's right. to really bring down, drastically reduce our greenhouse gas emissions to avoid catastrophic and irreversible climate change. So. Obviously, the oil and gas industry is really important to New Mexico, and it's a part of all of our daily lives. So realistically, how do we as a state address the emissions problem and our adaptation problems as we bear the brunt of climate change here in the Southwest? Well, I, um, I want to also thank Kavu for uh, inviting me and inviting all of us uh, here tonight because these are the kinds of efforts and these are the kinds of panels that can address these in a meaningful way. So one, uh, the first thing that states can do is they can participate directly in the country and internationally in doing something about climate change and identifying that they're gonna be leaders. So New Mexico should join the US Climate Alliance. It should uh, immediately then work on the Paris Climate Accord. And as a result, we should be pivoting yesterday, decade ago, 50 years ago into renewable energy. That has to happen. It's got to, and, and, and it's an important place to pivot because if, you, if we just focus and we're not, um, if, if I'm lucky enough to have anything to do with it, we're not just going to address the accountability and mitigation issues. We're going to pivot immediately into renewable energy. But we have to have our own methane mitigation rule. All right, so the federal government is rolling that back. They're rolling back everything they can uh, with the Environmental Protection Act. It's clear that states are going to have to take responsibility. And I really think John gave a very powerful uh, both ends of the spectrum. You have real accountability because the state leads that and says, look, we're going to have a methane uh, recapture rule, period. We aren't going to flare. Uh, we're, you're going to use it. We know you're going to be really excited about the fact that you could make two to 300 million more. And I'm going to be real excited about two things. Most importantly, I'm not adding to the greenhouse gas emissions. We're doing something about the methane plume uh, in San Juan County. And early estimates indicate, uh, and we've got members of the legislature and Speaker Egoff here, another $27 million in tax revenue. And here's what I say and see universal early childhood education. That's 5,000 additional students. So we do that by not only establishing the requirement, but then we're using infrared technology and we direct our labs to do a better job giving us new ways to not only detect, but prevent, including replacing all the pneumatic valves. We also require, you need electricity at every one of these oil pumps. They have to have solar. So you create now an environment where oil and gas is as responsible in that effort as they can be, that they are assisting us in building a cleaner, more productive infrastructure, and that they are providing then resources into renewables and into the state's priorities. They have to be part of this solution. And I think that's what's happened, is that we've, we, have, we have allowed in this country and around the world that given that we don't have sufficient uh, fuel supplies because we have failed to do renewable, right? We haven't had an all of the above energy plan. And then as a result, I think too many political leaders have been afraid to create the kind of serious requirements and standards that allow you to do reclamation, responsible, right, regulation, and to bring every single department to bear on making sure that occurs. So how do we do that fast enough? So one of the things, I've been a reporter since during the Bush administration. And so what happened was you had the Bush administration moving backwards, and then Governor Richardson was elected, and state agencies, John's familiar with this, state agencies were moving forward on climate change issues. And then we kind of 
uh, went backwards on the state level and then now on the federal level. If we have a decade, how do we do this fast enough? That I'm gonna answer this in, in two ways. Um, there is an, I, I, I'm gonna just make an assumption that either everyone in this fabulous theater, which the very first time I was allowed to go to a movie by myself, it was right here in this theater, and this will date me. It was gone with the wind. <laughs> um, <laughs> we all believe in climate change. We, we didn't need this report. We've been panicked, I think, well, productively, I hope, well before Al Gore was really providing the kind of images that are forever with us about what is really occurring and watching not only the weather patterns and the serious um, uh, uh, climate change effects, including it's no longer drought as you identified it. I mean, drought is too narrow a term to describe about what's really happening uh, in the Southwest and Western part of the United States and the, and the world. So we believe it. We're gonna have to do everything in our power every single day, and I'm daunted by this report, and it scares me, because I worry that too many other states, too many other uh, uh, policymakers, the current federal government, and too many other countries are, are just not gonna come to bear. So I believe that New Mexico is seen often as an incredible leader in any number of these areas, and I think that we've got to immediately get our labs to take an international leadership role and do everything in our power in that regard. But the second issue is we see these political shifts, not, not just because of the resources involved, but because it's always winners and losers. And so in uh, the Richardson administration, uh, bringing environmental requirements, right, and holding folks accountable and doing everything that we could was seen as against the industry in total. And so the second there was a political shift, it's return us to the place that we were. And we do this back and forth, and as someone who is still in Congress, this is all we do all day long. If uh, you did it and I don't like you, then my only job isn't to understand it, to, to think about a way to offer a different solution, but to just get even with you by making sure that I repeal whatever that effort is and make it 10 times times harder for you to ever advance it again. What Kavu is doing is saying, look, we can bring people to the table. We can bring every community member, every worker in every one of these communities and counties. We can bring the ag industry together. We can bring the environmental community together. And that's really how Colorado led the country with uh, their methane mitigation or recapture rule. It's 150 pages of regulatory requirements that they are doing together. And while today there is some disagreement about where to go next, it is nothing like what I have seen in this state or in Congress when there is a debate between the fossil fuel industry and, and climate change or environmental considerations. We have a real opportunity to bring the Mexicans together and be two million strong about what we expect moving forward in the future. So Elisa, one of the big issues in southeastern New Mexico right now is produced water. Oil and gas industry is using a lot of fresh water and disposing of a lot of wastewater. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about what you see on a daily basis with that, and also what you think the Oil Conservation Division, um, as part of the state, can be looking forward to, to be regulating that better, to be inspecting better, to be a, a better part of that process. Well, I'm going to answer that part of the question first. Um, my main concern is the Oil Conservation Division does not look at the landscape when they're permitting. So it is extremely important that they look at the landscape and the impact if there were a spill or whatever. Um, we have an endangered species and a little river that runs through the ranch and through the farm. And no consideration in permitting the proximity to that river is considered. It takes protests by various and sundry people in order to get that even there. 
So number one is they need to look at something other than a flat piece of paper as to where it lands on that flat piece of paper. You need to look at the landscape. Also, there needs to be, um, thank you. Um, also, there needs to be regulations on containment on the locations. Um, there are no berms on around any of the locations so far. Uh, they have containment units for the tank batteries. They have where the offloading is occurring. They have a place where if there spills where their lines are, they will go into a capture unit. But nowhere is if there's any spillage anywhere else, is there any kind of containment unit. So there needs to be more regulations by even the agency in which this the SWD is going on their surface. So if it's on state land, there needs to be berms all the way around in addition to if there is runoff to contain that runoff somewhere. And, uh, and then there, there needs to be consideration for, again, the depth. They're all going into what's now called the Devonian depth for there because primarily at about a six, four to 6,000 feet, everything's full for produced water. And so um, there, there needs to be also the push to chemically treat the produced water to use it. And there are companies who are doing that. And there are companies who are using 60 to 70% of the treated water in doing their frackings. That is the number one push there needs to be, is to reuse the produced water when doing the frack and to figure out how to get it to get it pr uh, done. And a company that, uh, Marathon, is uh, out my back door on state land, and they used a huge amount of chemically treated produced water in one of the last fracks they did. And it, you know, it, it made a big difference on how much water, fresh water, was having to be used. So I think that's the number one thing, in addition to where you're putting it, is reuse that produced water, chemically treat it, and figure out how to do it in a safe manner in which it's transported over to the wells. So one of the other things that you talked about, and I think in the film you may have been referring to the traffic issue, but that the county is overwhelmed. The county can't handle this. How else would you like to see state or federal, either regulations or regulators, helping out in the southeastern part of the state? It does not take two years to figure out a study and what in the heck to do about traffic, number one. And there are people out there that are smart enough to figure out how to build a road that they don't have to have a capital P period, capital E period after their name to be able to build road. We have county roads that were built by county people that are still in great condition that the ones that were built with engineers, because everything has to be engineered now, are falling apart. So the first thing that has to be done is there has to be money going back into those areas. We cannot have all the money staying in northern New Mexico. Sorry, guys. We're producing it. We need it back down on our end. There was a bill in the state legislature several years ago that Catherine Brown brought in about having more of the money stay in southeastern New Mexico to go to the roads, and it never got out of the Energy Committee. Um, because they said they needed better roads in Mora County than we needed in Eddie Lee and Chavez County. Sorry, but that was the answer. You know, let's be factual about this. You've got to look at how things are, and you've got to get the, you have to get these roads built to where they are going to stand up to all the heavy traffic. We finally, out of county funds, are building a seven-mile stretch that was in the film redoing a seven mile stretch and instead of doing the two inches of asphalt that normal roads have, they're going to put in six inches of asphalt in order for that road to be able to hold and maintain the level of it. So you have to have common sense. And when did it go out the window for things that are being done when it is required to do by county money, state money, federal money? There's got to be common sense. One of the things that I do want to respond to something that uh, Congressman Woman, Michelle. that Michelle said, because I have, 
Um, when you were talking about electricity on the wells and using solar, one of the problems they're having is theft. They had huge compressors out there, and people would come, cut the wires, steal the compressors, and here they would have all of this production. So you've got to consider the real-life fact that there is, as Mark said in the film, the theft is overwhelming. So there's got to be some way to figure out how to do something. They're stealing solar panels, too, to be able to do that. So in response to that, it's a great idea. It's, it's carrying those things out. So, Garrett, I wanted to ask you. You and I have daughters about the same age. Um, and I think that you, in some of the work you've done in the past, you've been able to bring people of different backgrounds together on issues. And I'm wondering how in New Mexico, given the hold that the oil and gas industry has on the state, I mean, it does, it's a huge part of our state, um, and the pressing challenges that we face, how do we cross aisles? How do we work together? How do we do that, Garrett, tell us. <laughs> you know, one of the things I'm most excited about, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> One of, one of the uh, things I'm most excited about, uh, we're, there's a big coalition of very diverse stakeholders that is talking about a state environmental policy act. We have NEPA, which is a national environmental policy act, but New Mexico very badly needs a state environmental policy act. Um, and, and that really begins to address a lot of what you're talking about. Um, but the most exciting thing about this process is the stakeholders, stakeholders that are involved and who are at the table. And, and um, you know, New Mexico is one of the hardest places to organize in. When we were uh, working on getting Rio Grande del Norte, the National Monument, established, uh, it was incredible. We had a Sequia Parciantes, we had land grant heirs, we had uh, Picuris and Taos there, we had sportsmen and environmentalists and ranchers. And, um, you know, and, and, and the beauty of New Mexico is the one common love that we all have is our love of the land and our association with the land. And uh, when you put that little nugget in the middle of the table, uh, you know, a lot of people fight, but, but when, you, when you have a common goal, um, and this is what's been part of this SEPA process, uh, I think people start to come together. And, and I really, uh, for the oil and gas folks in this room, I, I really would hope that you would redraft a new social contract with New Mexico and, uh, and be a, a true stakeholder, a community member, and, and see yourselves as, as an equal stakeholder in that process. But I think that New Mexicans are, are really, we're some of the best at uh, coming to the table. We like to fight, right? We're all fighters. Um, but at the end of the day, our love of the land and, and, uh, and our uh, amazing history, you know, 15 to 20,000 years of human history on this place and our amazing cultural identity. And I think we always have to think about this state and that all these lands are Aboriginal lands. Um, our cultural identity is priceless. And um, I, I think that when we start to look at things in those contexts, uh, that we can really solve these problems. And, and, and we really do need to think about what New Mexico looks like 100 years from now. And let's not talk about tomorrow, but what does New Mexico look like 100 years from now? So we can do this, and, and, and I'm really excited. So John, given your experience working in state government and, and some of the issues that the Richardson administration was pushing um, during that time, and having worked in the nonprofit world with industry, with the federal government, what do you think that a new governor, a new Congress, uh, the state legislature, what are the top issues that they really need to be hitting? It's a great question and a very timely one, obviously. Um, we, um, so I think, um, and I mentioned it in the film, but I think you know we have this world-class energy resource here in oil and gas, but also in solar, in wind, um, you know, et cetera. Um, what we don't have is the system at the state level to make sure that we're getting the maximum benefit from it, that we're harnessing it, and that we're at the same time minimizing the negative impacts like you're feeling down in southeastern New Mexico right now. Um, and we really have the opportunity to create that now. This boom in the Permian is, you know, creating a tremendous amount of opportunity. It's a windfall, really, for the state. 
And if we don't stop right now and invest it in the future in creating the world-class regulatory system to go along with our world-class energy resources, we're really gonna be missing a, a tremendous opportunity. I mean, I think um, the Congresswoman and Garrett have talked about the IPCC report and how um, sobering it was. The other thing that happened that day that I wanna mention um, is the Nobel Prize in economics was announced. And um, you know, a, a New Mexican won the Nobel Prize in economics, Bill Nordhaus from Albuquerque, for his work in this area. You know, we have the resources here in New Mexico to fix these problems at the labs. Um, you know, we have the brains in this room to do this. But what we don't have right now is the leadership to bring that all together, to harness it, and to get it headed in the right direction. And that's what we really need to create. So, Representative, we talk a lot about how communities should, have, should be able to make their own decisions about what happens to their lands, what happens to the money that the resources earn. How does government, either on a federal or a state level, how does government empower people in their own communities to have a long-term vision for the resources? A lot of people like to complain about government regulation. I think we all do, whether we admit it or not. So how does... Every time it's tax season, every <laughs> single one of us complain about government regulation. Exactly. So how, do, how does government empower people while protecting communities, while giving people voice? By including communities in the decision making at the front end and then checking in with them about whether or not it's really working. And this is what government often fails to do and uh, the models that really work public health models where you have a presence in that community, you're checking in with that community, they have to be part of the planning of the next set of services. And we didn't do that. I mean, I've, I've been really disappointed. Um, we, we, there's not a single community in the country that isn't clear about planned, proactive, responsible development and growth. So even if it's not oil and gas in this state, you have to figure out water when you're looking at any kind of development. And we knew the potential in the Permian Basin. And as the technology for all of it, including fracking, which means that you limit the number of, of drill sites or the wells, you're able to identify and capture more of that oil. And so this opportunity was always right there. You don't double the number of the, of the oil wells and don't think about what you, that does to the community. So they didn't do housing or other public safety or law enforcement or schools or roads. And I might, I might push back just a little. If you live in Mora and your roads are so bad that no business and no family will stay and you can't farm or ranch there, or I was in Shiprock at the Shiprock Fair Parade and I think it's the first time ever that the uh, uh, folks in the Navajo Nation were stopping me and saying promise promise us you will do something about these roads because it's become so unsafe because we haven't dealt with the potholes going uh, um, west to Arizona that you have to switch lanes in a two-lane road and the number of uh, fatalities has greatly increased. But here's what we do to you. We say to you, because we won't think about it in the long term, we don't have short-term immediate solutions, we really prefer to create losers losers, losers, and a winner, we ask you to fight for what you need for your family and your community. You go against Mora. Well, that's not how it should work, which is why one of the priorities for this windfall from oil and gas has to be for infrastructure statewide so that everyone feels like they are participating. And here's another incredible part about being proactive. If we're proactive about addressing these issues, 
while there, there are resources, this is also a state that's been starved for a long time, and we're going to see a lot of folks, and if I'm lucky enough to be in that situation, I, I'm feeling a little anxious about where all of these resources need to go. You know, we're a billion dollars behind in water infrastructure. We're $6 billion behind in infrastructure in just four categories, right? Schools, water, broadband, roads. That's not everything we need. It's the four big categories, $6 billion behind. So in addition to making sure there's a return on these investments so that these communities can be made safe and as whole as possible, this industry who has increased their footprint, I think if we ask and keep and, and invite them to the table with these communities, which is to your question, I think they're willing to directly do more in that infrastructure. <laughs> they are. And so we have failed to put everyone together. And, and this is a time with a decade out, with renewed enthusiasm, not just in our state, but around the country, to getting all of it right for people who I think are willing more than ever to stay active in these designs that we didn't see maybe five years or a decade ago. And I think that's really going to shift the way in which we keep people working together and that communities will feel entirely empowered. We're going to keep checking in and we're going to ask them to participate in making these decisions all the time, not just during the legislative session. Great. Thank you. So I want to get to audience questions, but I'm going to ask the panelists really quickly, just run on. I feel like everybody here tonight, you care about these issues. You care about New Mexico. There is a very good chance that you feel overwhelmed and maybe a little hopeless and maybe a little helpless right now. I know that I do every day, given sort of the, the depth of our challenges right now. So you all have a captive audience here tonight. One piece of advice, what we all need to be doing as consumers or how we start moving towards solutions. And we do want to get to audience questions, so if you could just be fast. Uh, I'll, I'll keep mine very fast. Can I just do one word? Yeah. Okay, vote. <laughs> I think it needs, the most important thing is the personalities have to go out it's not about me, it's about us. And when it's not about who's in charge, but what gets done, then you'll have more success. I just, this is the most special place in the world. I've, I've been all over the world and, and we have something that is so unique and so amazing. And uh, we're the envy of the world right now, but imagine what we can and should be, and, and, and leading the world in a time when the world needs leadership. And uh, no pressure, but I'm gonna hand the microphone <laughs> over to our next governor, hopefully. Very nice. We have all been pulled in a million different directions, which I think adds to the anxiety we all feel about, I can't do any more. I can't even emotionally respond to one more thing. Um, I mean, I felt that this weekend with just the Kavanaugh vote. I just, it, it's overwhelming. But then I think about, I'm in a position to save New Mexico. And so are all of you. And I think that's what gets the trick done. Thank you. Job done. Do you have, oh, and we've got questions. Okay, sorry, we are, holy smokes, y'all have a lot to ask tonight. Um, okay, we are not going to get to all of these, but we'll do our best. Okay, um, if there's not a specific person identified, hopefully one of you can jump in. What is the carbon impact of the billion dollars worth of leases? Is southern New Mexico immune or more vulnerable to catastrophic climate change? Well, I mean, the, so the, the carbon impact of uh, the methane emissions from those leases is huge. I mean, it's pound for pound 80 times more powerful than carbon dioxide. It's leading to a quarter of the warming we're already experiencing. 
um, the International Panel on Climate Change report said that um, you know, in order to, to hit that 12-year target, we need to simultaneously be driving down our carbon emissions and our, our short-lived climate pollutants or methane emissions as well. So we really, you know, we need to be acting on both. We need to be promoting renewables um, while at the same time, you know, ramping down the, the pollution problem from methane. Um, and I forget the second part of the question. Oh, is Southeast New Mexico vulnerable? Absolutely. I mean, you know, you can speak to the, to the drought you've been experiencing down there. Um, <laughs> right. But, you know, the, the forecast, the, the climate experts say that with cl a changing climate, the droughts will become longer and more severe and there'll be less water um, and less, uh, you know, mountain snow melt uh, to feed the Santa Fe River, uh, to feed the reservoirs here that are a big part of the, the drinking water system in Santa Fe. So, yeah, absolutely, it's a problem. So the next question is, how can New Mexico rethink its reliance on oil? By diversifying the economy and shifting to renewable energy. I mean, I, we, we, we have failed to actually just do that. So let's do that. That has to happen in the 2019 legislative session. You set those renewable portfolio standards. We get the transmission lines done. We are in a unique position to shift in ways that so many states really can't do. And we're in a position to help all those states reduce their carbon emissions by virtue of exporting our incredible solar and wind. States like New Mexico really are in a position not only to address our own problems, but to be a key player in addressing those same problems for the rest of the country. Uh, and we can do, and that's a whole other forum. But there are so many uh, other areas where we are leaders, but we have failed to realize our potential. This issue with climate change and what's going on in our state gives us great opportunity to shift in so many other ways. And that's what we need to do. And that's what will solve this reliance issue unequivocally. And another huge one is ecotourism and outdoor recreation. It, it's a ten, ten, $10 billion industry in New Mexico. It's a $30 billion industry in Colorado. We should have a $40 billion industry, 200,000 direct jobs with a cultural overlay Again, we have things in New Mexico that nobody else has. 27 million acres of public land, 19 Pueblos, the Apache Nations, the Navajo Nations. It's just incredible, the, the, the potential. It's, a, it's, it's, a, it's, it's an incredible cabinet of delicious ingredients. We just, uh, we need the right chef. So this audience member writes, water, water, water. Water was lately touched on in tonight's film, but given its scarcity this year, could you speak more on where the oil and gas industry is getting all of this water and at what cost to the rest of the state? So the, the water is either is primarily coming out of wells uh, that originally was probably agriculture uh, and they're changing the use of it. It's all underground. None of the surface water that was, uh, is in like the Carlsbad Irrigation District, none of that surface water can be used for the oil and gas industry. So it's all underground water that's being used. And, um, you know, it's, it is not being renewed as rapidly as everything else. So if they're going to use that much water, then there's got to be the technology to reuse the produced water. So we touched on this a little bit, but shouldn't the use of the current huge income from oil and gas be used specifically to invest not only in the future of affected lands, but also to cre create renewable energy infrastructure to replace this? And how do we get that in motion? How do we mandate that? I mean, I, these are all these are these are really uh, incredible questions. I don't want to take over the whole thing, but um, this 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 2019 session with 1.2 billion, which is actually growing, so those estimates could go up. A couple of things: it's not all recurring, so you get sort of one shot at a time to deal with this. Uh, if you tie it so specifically 
to just renewable, we miss the opportunities to do the other diversification that allows us to have the kind of recurring income, and that's something that New Mexico really suffers from. So when Garrett talked about uh, an outdoor and tourism and an arts cultural economy, these are recurring investments which allow you, in addition to sort of tying, well, if, if this is happening in oil and gas, then I want to see this happening in renewable. What we're going to have to do is set really an all of the above economic and energy uh, response. If we fail to do that in this, in this effort, in this environment, we will be chasing one or the other and creating the exact environment that you alluded to, which is we're always fighting over one scarce thing over another, and we don't have a comprehensive effort, and that's how we should deal with water as well. It's all connected. You need a 50-year, you need a long-term water plan that talks about innovation, conservation, and management, and you have to tie it all together. Being so specific that dollar for dollar is just one for one will not move us far enough along uh, in ways that this state both needs and deserves. So I would argue for get it all done and be very clear. If you've got the accountability and they're at the table and the environmental community's at the table and the rest of our economic folks, you, we will see the kinds of changes that people are interested in advocating for uh, in this uh, uh, what is this? This forum and gathering tonight. The, one other piece that I wanted to add to that, that that we haven't talked about tonight, and I think in part because Daryl's not here, and Daryl could really speak to it best, is um, the jobs opportunity in methane capture. You know, we talked about economic transition. How do we how do we get off of this boom and bust roller coaster of oil and gas? Um, and I think one of the ways we do that is by mandating capturing this methane. That's creating jobs, um, you know, that, that takes the, the roller coaster, kind of takes the lumps out of it. Um, you know, you have to go out and frequently inspect these sites. That's an inspector's job that is there. Um, you have to create the infrared cameras like we saw being used where you can see the emissions. Those are being built and manufactured and sold. Um, you know, those are New Mexico jobs. New Mexico has these jobs already um, it's 10th in the nation, but it's got room to grow. Uh, states that have acted to reduce these emissions are like at three on that list, at four on that list. So we can, we can move up the list um, by acting on this. One thing I want to point out is we do not have the infrastructure in transmission lines for renewable energy. So that's part of why renewable energy is not where it is now, because there's we can put all the solar panels in the world out there, but where are we going to send the electricity? So that's one of the big things. And how long has it been that we've been trying to get Zia? You know, there's a lot of issues that go along with it because I'm one of those that I don't want another transmission line through my property. So all of this is a, a big web that has to be intertwined and worked on. So if you're going to have renewable energy, you've got to have the infrastructure, the transmission lines to get it out of here. You can't just have it. True enough. So um, I hadn't actually been down to Carlsbad in a few years and was down there in June and was really surprised to see kind of a lot of the changes happening there. And I heard lots of <gasps> when the prices of the hotel rooms was up. I'll just let you all know, I could not afford to stay in a hotel room, and I spent $120 to sleep in a lady's guest room. Uh, had a little bed and bathroom. So it's like crazy expensive down there. Um, but what, somebody here wrote, I wonder how anyone would voluntarily continue to live in the Carlsbad area. A friend of mine who's lived there for at least 30 years has told me she can no longer stand to go outside. Um, uh, she mentions the overburdened hospitals and roads that are congested and dangerous, um, and they're leaving because they can. Um, and she, 
the, I think this one, um, writes, my heart is heavy thinking of those who would like to continue to call southeastern New Mexico home. And I was wondering, Elisa, if you could talk a little bit about that, that there, there have been all of these changes, and what kind of burden is that on people who have lived there for a long time? All, not just the, the infrastructure on your land, but all of these, you know, attendant changes. So there have been a lot of people who have lived there all their lives and they're moving somewhere else. They just do not want to, um, it's not a small town anymore. You know, we have a small town attitude and they miss the small town infrastructure, the small town way of life, everything small town. We're not growing, those of us who are in resistance over this, over that, we're not growing with it. I can't tell you. I can, I have no answers. I'm I'm not moving. It's kind of the pits, but I refuse to move. Um, you adjust. You put gates on places you've never thought you were going to put a gate in your life, just to make sure people don't come in. Um, it's a little scary. I I'm just real glad I have dogs that bark. I still don't lock the door to my house at night. I still leave the cars in my truck, but I also live in the middle of nowhere. Um, but it, it is a, it is, it is a, it's with any community which has a boom for any kind of increase in activity. It doesn't have to be oil and gas. It's no matter what. If that community has grown as a result of something which has brought more industry in there, the growing pains are out of sight and there's just you just try to figure out how to deal with it the best you can and it's going to take place no matter what industry there is and um, you have to have a whole lot of faith <laughs> you have to have a whole lot of uh, Miller Lite um, <laughs> and then you go from there So whether we're talking about, you know, for those of us who don't live close to oil and gas infrastructure and see these amazing aerial photos or hear about the impacts, I think it's easy to say, we just don't want to do that anymore. Or if you think about the cuts um, that the IPCC report is saying that we need to be making, um, there need to be drastic cuts in our fossil fuel use. And so I think this is a question that people think about often. Um, somebody wrote, can our state economy function without oil and gas? I'm going to answer that real quick, and then I'll let the others. Um, so on state land alone, as of they were figuring the income off of the sale of royalties, there was over, I think it was $383 billion, of, and that was you know, projected, and I think it's uh, much higher than that. Renewable energy on state lands was 25 million, you know. You have to look at, at what's coming in and what you're giving up in order to have that kind of money in your state in order to do the things that we want to do for our state. There's a give and a take. You have to weigh it. What is it worth to you to have the whatever. And I can't tell you as far as what else is there. Look at New Mexico. We've been here forever. Look what we haven't done. You know, we've, we've kind of rocked along. We look at Arizona and they're booming and we're not. What's different? Are, do we want to boom like Arizona? Well, we are down in Carlsbad. But we're, we haven't dealt with it well. So we, there has to be, I think, the the thing about, you know, how are we going to do things? You have to look at it as a whole. We're giving up a lot, but we're getting a lot. Are we willing to give to get? That's, that's the question. That's the whole thing. Are we, are we willing to give up some of our not having to lock our doors or how things are going or having to sit in traffic 10 or 15 minutes longer or whatever? Are we willing to give up some of the things that we were used to doing in our small town life to get the benefit that everyone's been talking about of how are we going to spend that money 
It is a benefit to our state. It's a benefit for our schools. So are we willing to give what we're getting? And that is the elephant in the room. And I have profited personally by royalty sales because our, my family, luckily, when we were talking about the Homestead Act. So, I, I, I mean, our, our family is, has done well. We haven't done as well as some others, but we have benefited from it. And I uh, have used a lot of that to benefit others, you know, and that's my choice. So um, the state of New Mexico has to decide we're benefiting from getting all of this oil and gas revenue in. And are we willing to share and what are we willing to do with it? And are we going to do it in a selfless manner that we're not looking at what we profit from as individuals or as politicians or as whatever? You can put any name you want to on it. But what we're coming in and what we're getting from this boom in New Mexico, are we willing to make the sacrifice and wisely make the decisions that benefit New Mexico as a whole and is going to make our state to where it is a wiser state and a better state and more people are benefiting from what I might be losing in some grass and some headaches with the sleep and the whatever. That's our decision. What are we willing to give up to get for other people to benefit from. So you have been a wonderful audience tonight and there are lots of great questions left, but I promised to get y'all out of here by nine. So please give our panelists a huge round of applause. I'd just like to thank every, each and every one of you for, that came tonight, and, and, and that's all. This is all, the, the entire evening is on kavu.org, as well as all of the uh, videos from this and others, and, and it's a continuing series. We, we, have, we have another couple to come, so thank you very, very much for your participation and for your support. Thank you all. Please sign the petition on your way out. I would sure appreciate that. Thanks again.